All right, well, welcome everybody to the uh, second roundtable discussion uh, to talk about the global financial crisis. Uh, we have a number of folks from the economics and finance faculty. Uh, today's format's going to be different than last week or two weeks ago. Today we're really going to have more of a discussion. Um, we're going to do a couple things up front. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going through the government's response uh, to the crisis, at least the U.S. government's response. It'll take me about three or four minutes. Uh, and then some of my colleagues are going to uh, uh, add some remarks. And then we'll really open it up for questions from you guys. Um, before we start, it's always helpful, again, to sort of gauge the audience. I'll ask our panelists first. If you're in the finance faculty, raise your hand. Uh, economics faculty? Still? Still? Okay. Uh, and then in terms of the audience, uh, uh, how many faculty are out in the audience? Four or five from different disciplines. Uh, staff? from various parts of, uh, of staff. How many second year MBAs? First year MBAs? Masters of Finance? Masters of Supply Chain or OR? MAC? Undergrads? Nobody's gonna admit to that. Um, <laughs> any other programs I've insulted by leaving out? <coughs> PhD, I'm so sorry. <laughs> PhD, you're right, oh my gosh. Uh, and then there are a couple of alumni as well, I think. Part-time students? So uh, we're well represented by uh, all the different uh, aspects of, of Weatherhead. <clears throat> the um, Troubled Asset Relief Program, or so-called TARP, uh, the second time was finally passed. It was um, Bill 1424. It was passed in uh, early October. Uh, something called the Office of Financial Stability was created, and there was also something called the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, of 2008 that was enacted. Essentially what this was, it's been pretty well publicized, $700 billion was authorized um, to be spent in stages. The first $350 billion was authorized immediately, $100 billion if certified by what is now a lame duck president, and um, I was supposed to get a laugh, and then uh, the remaining $250 billion if Congress uh, approves it. And with the changes of the implementation, there's actually, I think, a little bit more uh, concern about whether Congress would actually approve the remaining $250 billion. Uh, interesting, if you go back to what the components of TARP were, there were about six or seven different programs under this. Interesting that very few of them have actually been implemented so far. First was that there'd be a mortgage-backed uh, security purchase program, so all these toxic assets that were sitting on all these financial institutions, there was going to be a program in place to use some of that money to repurchase those. To date, very, very little of that has actually been repurchased. I think none of it. Secondly, whole loan, loan purchases, so these loans that were sitting sort of stalled uh, on a bunch of banks' balance sheets, those would be purchased as well. Those have not been implemented as well. The third is an insurance program for both mortgage-backed securities and whole loans. There are a number of uh, insurance programs that have been implemented by the government. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, the fourth, there was some notion of equity purchase. So in other words, the uh, Treasury investing equity funds in a number of financial institutions. It was not really what was discussed when this plan was first put into place, but as we all know, that's really the one program that has been uh, implemented fairly, uh, fairly broadly. Uh, fifthly, which is something that people are still trying to work out, some kind of home ownership preservation, having the government come in and, so, and, and try to act as um, a body to essentially renegotiate mortgages so that people will get some relief on uh, their, uh, their, their cash flow burdens from their mortgages. And then there were also, there was a long discussion, uh, something that ended up coming in the final bill in terms of putting limitations on executive compensation, all these folks who got rich off of all this stuff uh, and trying to at least put some limitations on that and then uh, oversight and compliance. Interesting, the New York Times uh, estimated that to date, the government exposure to this whole financial crisis is over $5 billion. Um, I'd urge you to go to the New York Times uh, website. There are a number of multimedia um, uh, diagrams. This is a summary of it. And this one uh, graphic they had, this is really only going back, says November 28th when the Fed first started lending money. But if we take a look at the concentration in dates, most of what has been done has really been done in the last month and a half. Interesting. Um, the, the, the Times broke out the support, which adds up to about, uh, about $5 billion, into the government acting as a bank, really the Fed doing what they do uh, as a bank, but we can see that they've broadened 
that a lot. And if we were to take a look at the Fed's balance sheet today versus even a year ago, it's a much bigger balance sheet as they've played a more fundamental role. Second column is them acting as an insurer. And if we take a look at what some of those key things were, uh, when J.P. Morgan agreed to take <coughs> over Bear Stearns, the, the, the government essentially backstopped a bunch of 29, a, a bunch of uh, mortgage-backed securities that were sitting on Bear Stearns' balance sheet to the tune of 29 billion. Um, when uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, essentially um, were, were went into receivership, the government didn't quote unquote take them over, even though they're they're in receivership. They basically backstopped uh, 200 billion dollars of, of of commitments under them, so they really acted as a guarantor. Uh, when the money market uh, collapsed, uh, or certainly was very, very tight, the Fed agreed, uh, I'm sorry, Treasury agreed to guarantee uh, money market accounts so that money market uh, accounts wouldn't break the buck, and hopefully that liquidity would go back into the market. Um, when uh, there was some question about the Japanese bank who was gonna invest in, in Morgan Stanley, uh, the Fed uh, agreed to, uh, I'm sorry, Treasury agreed uh, to guarantee the investment the Japanese uh, financial institution made in that. And then in the last couple of weeks, we can see that there's you know, essentially uh, billions of dollars of backstop on, on banks, uh, senior subordinated debt, non-interest bearing deposits. Uh, and recently, the Fed said that they're gonna be the buyer of last resort for commercial paper. So a lot of that going on. As an investor, the, the uh, government has also invested a lot of money. Um, they uh, made a significant investment in AIG when it was failing, followed that up with an additional investment, and then as part of that $350 billion first tranche of investment um, that I said was under TARP, they've invested some of this $250 billion that are gonna go into banks. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's five, five trillion. I don't know why I, s I said five billion. What's a couple of zeros, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, if we take a look at the shift in mid-October, uh, really, I think, mostly following other governments around the world, uh, you know, the, the, the government decided they're going to shift to equity investing. And I put equity in quotes because if we take a look at the standard term sheet, what they invested in was perpetual preferred stock, relatively low initial dividend of 5% that bumps up. Um, because it's perpetual preferred stock, it counts as what's called tier one capital, so it boosts the capital base of the banks without the bank, without the, without the government actually owning a piece of the bank. <clears throat> In addition to that, there are warrants uh, for an amount of stock equal to 25% uh, of the preferred investment that's struck at the market. So let's say they invested $10 billion in Bank X. Um, they would get warrants for $2.5 billion, and if the stock price at the time was $25, they would get uh, uh, would get, um, what did I just do in my math, 100,000 share, or 100,000 warrants? I think that's where, I think you follow the, the math there. Um, in addition to that, and this is interesting, uh, there was a limitation on dividend increases. So the, uh, the government still wanted these banks to pay their dividends, and there also was some limitation on executive pay. But if you take a look at some of the controversy, um, you know, some people are very concerned that Essentially, these banks have taken the money. It's not being recirculated into additional loans. What's really happening is that banks are using that money to do three things, which I don't think was attended. Pay the dividend. So we're taking government money to pay shareholders dividends. That's continuing. Executive compensation. There's a bunch of, of um, publicity on huge bonuses in some of these institutions. Uh, and a lot of this restriction on compensation is really targeted at the top, top management. Still a bunch of what I'll affectionately call rank and file people within these institutions who make millions of dollars. You know, they can't afford to lose them, so some of that money's going uh, towards that, uh, as well as, as we know, unfortunately, from here in Cleveland, towards acquisitions. One of the big recipients of the second tier of capital was PNC, who frankly was given more in funding than it was costing them to buy National City. So as I said, pretty open-ended uh, use of proceeds. Um, the first wave of investment was announced, I think, on October 14th. All these large institutions uh, were given uh, committed funds. Uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley had already announced that they were going to become bank holding company, um, uh, bank holding companies, so they essentially were banks. And I don't know if anybody saw the interview um, with the CEO of, uh, of uh, Bank of America, 
on uh, 60 Minutes, but you know, when they talked to Lewis about this, he said, look, you know, I made a plea to everybody that you needed to take the money. It wasn't really a choice. We don't know what we're going to do with it, but you know, it's unpatriotic not to take this money. So essentially, all these guys agreed to take it. In the last couple of weeks, uh, it's really, uh, it's kind of interesting to see how quickly it jumps down in size. These are the other recipients of equity, at least that have been announced, that will be invested. It's about $35 billion in total. So the first way was that we add that up, it's about $125 billion. So half of that 250 went to these big institutions. You know, it's a pretty long list of a couple dozen institutions almost. These add up to $35 billion. Interestingly enough, the biggest by a long shot is PNC. There are a number of other uh, uh, Ohio-based institutions, Fifth Third, uh, and Key Corp are fairly high up on the list uh, as well. And uh, uh, again, the use of proceeds is pretty general. There are a bunch of other factors to think about as well, not just this government inter intervention in terms of investment in TARP. Uh, obviously, the, the Fed has lowered interest rates a couple of times since the crisis has, be be has begun. Uh, other G8 countries have also responded in a similar fashion, both with rate cuts as well as some type of equity investment to try to uh, improve the, uh, uh, the uh, capital base of the financial institutions. Uh, and interestingly enough, even though I think the TARP was initially intended to relieve homeowners of mortgage, bur mortgage burdens, um, really the biggest uh, banks, and particularly the ones who had acquired uh, some of the more troubling or troubled companies, have essentially started their own private mortgage restructuring uh, operation. Bank of America, who had bought Countrywide, announced a huge uh, restructuring where they're going to essentially privately renegotiate a bunch of mortgages, as will J.P. Morgan through Washington Mutual uh, in Wells Fargo, who's taking over Wachovia. So question of whether or not TARP, as it was originally intended, is even going to be used for restructuring uh, mortgages. Um, I'm not going to read this list. This is a list of various things that we might talk about today. So I think what I'll do is turn off this microphone, and um, in a minute we'll open it up. I've tried to very quickly go through the elements of the government intervention um, in really just describing it. What I'd like to do uh, is ask a couple of my economics colleagues, colleagues Justin and, 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 uh, and, and Nicola, to uh, go through your sort of reaction to this from an economic perspective. Uh, all right. I'm not sure if you can hear this. All right. How is that? Can you hear that? All right. So um, we talked a bit about the best way to do this, and I'm no grand expert in financial matters. So instead, what we decided we could do is take a good reading of what the economists who are experts were saying of this. So what I've done a bit is try to distill sort of the collective wisdom as I can read it from you know the Paul Krugmans of the world. Um, and run that down briefly for you, and then that hopefully will generate some discussion so we kind of have this common base. Um, and so what I, so a quick outline of what I thought I could talk about today was first um, just recap a little bit the underlying problem as sort of the economic consensus was. So what was the underlying problem? And then how did that inform the sort of two broad different approaches that people considered. So the first was the purchasing of toxic assets, which was what the plan was initially sort of sold at, and then what it ended up being more of this equity infusion. So we can talk about the economic consensus on that. Um, and then some reactions to the plan as it unfolded by sort of the major economic players. And finally, just a few brief comments on sort of is it, does it seem to be working? Um, so in terms of the, you know, what was wrong and what was the problem needing fixing, there was really pretty good consensus on this. I think most people in the room probably understand this. So the consensus among economists, at least, was that the problem was one of a lack of capitalization. So banks held mortgage-backed securities. As the housing bust started, the securities lost value. That loss of value put them closer to being insolvent, so they didn't have enough assets to meet their debt liabilities. That insolvency then, you know, makes them insolvent. So there's dangers of runs on banks, no one wants to lend, et cetera. And there's sort of two big problems here. So, you know, in principle, we should let an insolvent bank fail, right? It's a bad bank. But there are two problems with that. The first is that if there's a lot of insolvent banks, or especially big insolvent banks, letting them fail in the subsequent unwinding of their credit positions could cause big problems throughout the system. OK? 
okay, and problems that really affect the real economy. The second problem was even if a relatively small number of banks were truly insolvent and the rest were sort of on this margin, you had a, what's an adverse selection problem, what we call the classic lemons problem. Things were complex enough, the mortgage-backed securities are complex enough, the credit default swaps are complex enough, that nobody can tell for sure which assets are really bad, and nobody from the outside can really tell which banks are insolvent. So then when any bank tries to sell some assets to raise cash, well, they're assumed to be the ones selling the bad assets, right? So the, floor, the price on the assets falls through the floor. We have this fire sale problem. The other problem is then any bank that tries to issue debt or equity is also assumed to be one of the insolvent banks. So again, this lemons problem. Um, and so, so this is the problem. So everything freezes up. They can't sell their assets, they can't issue new debt, and they can't issue new equity. Um, in part because either they're insolvent or they're assumed to be insolvent because there's not enough transparency going on. So that sort of steps in the government's need to intervene in some way. And so this was really you know, freezing up in a way that mattered for the real economy. Loans not going out for mortgages, businesses, um, and just a general panic that everything was going to collapse, bank runs and the sort of things that cause systemic failures. And so there were sort of two broad approaches on what might happen. And the first sort of put forward by the Treasury plan was to buy up the toxic assets. So take these mortgage-backed securities, take them off the books. There was broad consensus by sort of leading economists that that wouldn't work, so that that was a bad plan. Um, and the consensus basically ran like this. Either it was ineffective or it was a horrible giveaway. So if you bought those bad assets at what they were worth in the market, you haven't solved the capitalization problem. The banks were fundamentally insolvent, their assets weren't worth enough. If you gave them what the assets were worth, you gave them liquidity, but you didn't solve the capitalization problem. They're still insolvent. The alternative was that you overpay for these assets quite a bit. So you buy these mortgage-backed securities that are worth, let's say, $50 in the market, and you pay them $100 for those, right? Well, that recapitalizes the bank. The bank now has the sort of money they need to do loans. Pay to the banks on the part of the taxpayers. And so that was sort of the big problem with that. The alternative that the majority of economists were pushing for was an infusion of equity. And so this is essentially what Warren Buffett did for Goldman Sachs, right? buying new shares, infusing this new equity. The new equity then can be used to support new loans, solves the insolvency problem. Um, and that's essentially, so when the initial bailout plan was passed, there was enough flexibility in the plan that either of those two directions were possible. So as Scott showed, you know, it had a lot of features to it, including the buying of toxic assets or the injections of equity. As it was passed, you know, sort of very beginning of October, October 3rd, it was unclear which direction the Treasury would really go. Economists were worried that they were going to try this buying up of toxic assets approach. So October 7th comes around, Gordon Brown and the Europeans start to do the injection of equity into their markets, and then Paulson and the Treasury here follow suit. So that's what's led essentially to this $250 billion being pumped in in the form of equity. Um, and so, so that's sort of what's happened in kind of the debate over which of those two broad approaches should happen. So reactions to that. Well, that's basically what the majority of the economists were calling for. And so the reactions to how the plan has actually unfolded, this, these injections of equity, has actually been by a large part very positive. So if you read the economists on down the line of the major players, their reactions are, this was necessary, this was the strong step, this is what had to happen. Um, but there's a lot of sort of quibbling about the details, right? In most of these things, the devil's in the details. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion about whether they're getting it quite right. So I'll hit on a couple of those just real quickly. Um, one is that, you know, there's, there's certainly a stream of people who thought this would be much better if the government could somehow facilitate private inject injections of equity rather than the government doing it with public funds. So what they basically are saying, what they'd like to see is the government facilitating more of these Warren Buffett sort of investments, um, bringing investors together, forcing the hands of the bank and forcing them to go out and get these so that they're not signaling they're a bad bank by asking for more equity, solving the lemons problem that way. But that wasn't really happening on its own, and it wasn't clear how the government could do that. So a lot of economists saw it as necessary, a necessary evil, if you will, but necessary that the government injected these funds. Um, there's also been some discussion about the way in which they're getting this money. So Scott touched on the fact that the equity that they're infusing is actually they're getting this preferred stock, which is paying this 
fixed dividend, right? They don't have a share in earnings growth. Um, and in particular, they didn't buy common stock that has a voting share. So economists are basically split on that one, whether that's a good thing. So the liberal side of economics, um, Brad DeLong's from Berkeley and Barry Eichengreen's from Berkeley of the world, um, which incidentally is where I went. So uh, those, folks, those folks actually would have preferred to see purchases of common stock, stock that gets a voting right, like they've done in Europe. So Europe mostly done, did that. And their reasoning is that they'd like the government to have a bigger say in what the banks actually do going forward. They're worried that the banks are going to misuse these funds and that the government should be having a more active role in what goes on. Um, the alternative to that, so more of the Chicago school sort of folks, um, have ar actually argued that private injections would be much better, but in lieu of that, at least it's good that the government didn't buy voting shares because that would be too far into the realm of socialization and nationalization and that it would be, one, hard for the government to roll that back over time, and two, the government would do all sorts of horribly inefficient and sort of politically expedient things messing with the banks, and it would hurt the sort of efficiency of the system. The economists are kind of split on that one. Um, another big thing that comes out in terms of a reaction to the bailout plan is that there seems to be a fair amount of worry that there's going to be a need for a lot more of this, that basically all of the money that's gotten into the system so far has gone towards servicing debts that already existed from subprime losses that already occurred. The danger is that the economy is still slowing, and so when you think about commercial lending, lending made to companies, lending made to consumers via credit card debt and things, people are worried that a lot of those defaults have yet to happen, and that what's going to happen is those defaults are going to mount and the banks are going to again reach this insolvency problem it's going to again require another big infusion of capital, and that while this seems to have worked temporarily, ultimately we may end up with basically a full nationalization of the banking industry. So another round of these injections big enough that the government essentially owns all of the banks. Um, so that's one worry. And then the, the sort of final kind of issue in the reaction is again this issue of whether, this, whether the government injection of equity was necessary. One hand, and this is something Nico can talk a bit more about, one hand, they, there's a school of thought that says the government could have facilitated more of these Warren Buffett type deals. So they could have facilitated private. And another says that an alternative approach would have been to streamline a bankruptcy process that gets rid of the insolvent banks quicker and deals with problems by wiping out equity shareholders, converting debt to equity. Nico can talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so final quick thing, is it working? Um, which is a good question. The, the basic answer is no one's sure completely yet. Um, and there is this worry that there's gonna be another massive need in the future. Um, the one thing that definitely seems true is that there has been a releasing of this air of panic, right? The, the panic has subsided, um, and that's a good thing. So this has definitely instilled some level of confidence in the markets. Um, the other thing is there does seem to be some signs of some loosening and some additional lending. Um, in particular, the TED spreads are improving. Um, two things sort of lurking that have people a little bit worried. Um, Scott already mentioned both of these actually. The one is that there's this worry that most of the money or a large part of the money could end up going to dividend payments. Um, and the other worry is that uh, banks are using a lot of their money to acquire other more troubled banks. To some extent that's not that's not all bad. So there, there is a lot of discussion amongst economists that there needs to be some contraction in the banking industry, that there, there is some value in having sort of good solvent banks take over some of these other weaker banks. Um, but certainly it means that there's a lot less of this money flowing into the lending system than people thought there would be. Um, so I think that's what I have to say. And so I don't know if we want to take questions or head to Nico on alternative plans. Yeah, well, why don't we, um, Nico, turn it over to you and make a couple sure. of comments. Uh, yeah, following on what uh, Dustin was saying, a few economists are actually sort of questioning the whole idea that the government, uh, the public sector, has to intervene at all with some sort of, for example, infusion of capital, buying assets, uh, and so on. And they're trying to see to what extent instead the market can, with some facilitation by itself, actually solve. Uh, solve this problem. So one of the issues that Justin mentioned was this idea of mandating banks to uh, issue new equity, and the mandate was, you know, supposed to be a way to you know, reduce this information asymmetry uh, problem with, you know, 
to issue equity, you are essentially giving bad news because you know you want to share the losses essentially. So, uh, but if you are mandated to do that, then you are not giving that um, that bad news. And the underlying assumption is that this asymmetric information problem was the key problem, and that there there are out there many Warren Buffets essentially willing to uh, to intervene at the right price with these sort of guarantees and. Uh, and buy and buy these additional uh, uh, stocks. Uh, in fact, uh, a few economists are starting, uh, which is quite amazing because it normally takes us some time to understand these things. But they're starting to do some research and collecting some data on whether this, uh, the the Paulson plan, as approved, was uh, effective at all. In terms of the following question: Has it created any value, right, for the banks, for society, and so on? And you know, very briefly. The technical paper just came out, but let me, let me just give you a, a sense of it. The idea is: is the uh, you know the value of the claims of the banks uh, increased enough to compensate the taxpayer money that is uh, that that goes into into holdings? And and so what uh, Luigi Zingales and Pietro Veronese at the University of Chicago have done is essentially looking at uh, the changes in the price of credit default swaps. Uh, right, which is an indicator of the value of the assets of banks, and compare uh, these uh, these changes uh, and the implication for the, the value of claims for banks to the money, the taxpayer money. And as it turns out, the difference between these two amounts is about zero. Uh, so there is no real value, according to them, created by this uh, uh, by this intervention. So the question is, can we do better than that? Can we do better than zero? Right. And one way to do better than zero, according to them, is eliminate the subtraction part, so not having any taxpayer expenses there. So a couple of ideas, uh, sort of creative ideas that uh, these economists came up with is one is a sort of renegotiation mechanism on Wall Street, as we can say, and one is a renegotiation mechanism on Main Street for the, the home market. So the idea is to create what uh, Luigi Zingale has called a quickie bankruptcy uh, system, essentially. it's a Pre-packaged bankruptcy uh, procedures such that banks can do the following things. So, normally when we think about you know filing Chapter 11, we have in mind like failing and liquidating and so on. That's actually not true. It's just a change of claims, right? So what banks can do is essentially transforming uh, their, uh, their debt into equity, right? This implies uh, wiping out the current shareholders and transforming the debt holders into shareholders. So all of a sudden. Banks have this equity buffer, so they can keep lending, which is the main problem essentially. So we want to have banks able to uh, to lend. As for the old shareholder, they would have the possibility, the option for one week, to buy the new shares that the debt holder have at the face value of the debt. So they would have an opportunity actually to uh, to regain their position uh, as uh, shareholders of uh, of the bank. So this comes at no expense for the taxpayers, and it's also an incentive mechanism for banks in difficulty to go through this procedure, <coughs> and not for all, uh, for all banks, essentially, to benefit if, you know, if, they don't need, if they don't need to, and so they don't feel patriotic that they have to get uh, this money. Uh, so that's the mechanism that they are uh, thinking about for you know, solving the problem of sort of Wall Street. How about the housing market? So there is also this debate on whether the, the government has to intervene and sort of solve the problem of people not being able to pay for their houses. Is there a value of keeping people in their houses and so on? So the idea is the following. So what happens when uh, the value of your house goes down and uh, you still have to pay your debt? Well, you might have an incentive not to pay at all and to default. Because even if you pay, you will be left with an asset which is worth much less, uh, right? So you have an incentive not to pay, you default. The foreclosure procedure uh, takes place, it takes some time, and in that time, since you don't own the house anymore, you don't have any incentive to keep the house in good shape, and so you have this underinvestment problem, so a series of costs actually uh, add up. How to avoid this to happen? So the old school way would be to say, uh, for the bank to say, okay, I forgive part of the debt, okay? You owe me 100, let's say you owe me uh, 70 all of a sudden, I forgive you 30, uh, 30%. This gives you an additional incentive to stay in the house, to repay the debt, and not to let the house essentially ruin, ruin itself. Uh, but you cannot do it any longer, because now it's not the bank that really owns your, uh, your mortgage any longer. With the securitization, you know, with myriad of investors all over the world, 
that you know own your uh, your mortgage so you really can't do that an alternative would be to essentially mandate lenders to revisit the value of the mortgage to the face value uh, of the house as of today right and the proposal is to do that all in those areas and those zip codes where the value of houses have decreased by at least 20 percent there is no reason to do it where houses have actually increased that value surprisingly there are some areas like charlotte North Carolina, where the houses are increasing their uh, their value, so they don't need to do that. The idea here is, you know, you reduce essentially uh, the uh, the principal on your debt and your in interest expenses. You are more likely to uh, to honor uh, your debt. What do the banks or the lenders in general get in return? Uh, a share, for example, a 50% share of any uh, appreciation of the house for now on. It seems like a weird plan, actually. It's already in place, for example, some schools like Stanford University, that's the way they help faculty uh, to buy their houses. Buy the house and we share any appreciation of the house uh, when you sell it, uh, essentially. We help you buying it and then we share the, uh, the appreciation. So these are all sort of market-based mechanism and renegotiation procedure that would avoid any sort of uh, you know, heavy involvement of the government in terms of decision power and in terms of you know, spending Taxpayer, uh, taxpayer money. Good. Well, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the current crisis in mimicking back to the Great Depression, sort of a historical perspective. David, do you have some some comments on on that? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So I think it's interesting to I mean to sort of pull us up to a kind of bird's eye view of things in, in talking about this, uh, the sort of historical parallels or lessons that you might learn from the Great Depression. And I think that's interesting to do because uh, the Great Depression sort of provides a template for what everyone is working very hard to avoid right now. So why, the, why does the federal government put itself on the hook for $5 trillion? Well, it's because it's, it's worried about, um, you know, about a, a sort of the sort of interlinked and, and sort of reinforcing crises that um, the U.S. and the rest of the world saw uh, between 1930 and 1939. Uh, and that's, I think, that um, the interlinkages and the fact that they were reinforcing is sort of the, um, the important part of it. And so in the, in the U.S., this involved crises in, the, in, in both the domestic financial sector and in the real economy happening more or less at the same time and feeding back into one another. Uh, as well as uh, in the in the uh, sort of balance of payments um, of the United States, re sort of related to, to kind of a crisis in the uh, with the gold standard and sort of international settlement, and so this made for a kind of uh, a kind of perfect storm. And uh, what I'll do is just kind of quickly highlight a few of the um, kind of facts about the Great Depression, and then and then talk about a couple of lessons. And uh, I guess then we can. Sort of open it up for uh, open up for questions. Uh, so what what made the Great Depression great? Um, well, <laughs> so between 19 and this is it's important to sort of understand these magnitudes. So so between uh, 1929 and 1933, this is in the U.S. Real GDP fell by 29 percent. Uh, consumption fell by 23 percent, and so we're you know concerned. This quarter, the, the U.S. economy contracted by three tenths of a percent. Well, uh, during that period, real GDP was falling at seven percent a year, uh, and it took until 1939 for for the U.S. to sort of reach its 1929 level. Uh, unemployment went from 3.2 percent in 29 to 25 percent, and was as, as high as 40 percent in some uh, in city manufacturing cities like Chicago. Um, and so, so economists don't think right now that we're likely to see anything this bad. I mean, people on the pessimistic side think maybe we'll see 10% unemployment and three or four quarters of, uh, of negative growth. And, um, you know, partly that's based on, on some sense that um, we know how to stem, uh, so to sort of stem the crisis and sort of get a handle on um, these interlinkages and, and vicious circles, and I'll say a little bit more, um, a little bit more about that in a uh, in a second. But and so this is sort of a, um, 
you know, these vicious circles are, and, and interlinkages are, are sort of parallel at a more macro level what Peter talked about, um, Peter talked about last time in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, the credit default swap uh, market or the commercial paper market, mortgage-backed securities and, and so forth. Um, and so lesson, lesson one of the Great Depression, I think, is to pay attention to these interlinkages and to vicious circles. And this is, in fact, what, uh, you know, one of the main focuses of the work that Ben Bernanke had, has done on the, uh, on the Great Depression, sort of trying to understand how uh, problems with bank failures or problems in the credit markets uh, feed back into household level consumption and business uh, and business investment. Um, and so what are the, I'll just talk a little about what the main sort of main events of the Great Depression were and how they relate to uh, these interlinkages. So basically the, the so, in 1928, you get sort of the beginning of a of a recession in the United States, partly due to uh, the sort of end of a boom in housing investment, uh, which was around 8% of GDP in the in the mid 20s, declining to zero, uh, and that sort of weakening, which is you know sort of looked like a standard recession in the beginning, um, was one of the sort of factors that led to the great stock market crash of uh, of 1929. Um, you know, which the S and P fell 30 percent uh, in a month, and part of that, part of the one of the sort of factors behind that was uh, efforts by the Fed to tighten monetary policy to curb the speculation in both the in the uh, in the stock market. However, this is you know during a time of uh, a time of recession when that's that's not what you're supposed to do, um, and so this sort of led to falling you know falling prices in the falling prices in the stock market with in an environment where interest rates were higher. And there was also this innovation in, in, uh, in, in sort of investment at the time called investment trusts in which uh, companies bought lots of stock on margin, so using loans, paying the interest on the loans with dividends on the stock, and uh, sort of using leverage in a way that's not totally dissimilar to what's been going on recently. Um, the problem is that that works really well when stock prices are going up, when dividends are declining and prices are, are, are declining. Uh, lenders will will you know do margin calls, want you to sort of advance more uh, more collateral, and that'll lead to sort of panic selling uh, and a kind of uh, sort of spiral of uh, spiral of deflation and and sort of this these debt problems. Um, and so that. And so th this sort of fed into a, a series of banking crises, not uh, not dissimilar to the ones that we're that we're seeing that we're seeing now. With um, you know, as Justin was talking about, runs on runs on banks, uh, failures of a few banks, leading to people having sort of loss of confidence in the whole in the whole banking system and and withdrawing their money. Uh, the difference in the 30s is that there was no FDIC. So if you're a small depositor in a regional bank. You know, you have your $500, uh, and you think the bank's going to go bust. You know, you better get it out of there because you're not. You're either going to you, to lose it all, or it's going to be years before you know you know what kind of haircut you're going to take and get uh, and get uh, and get the money back. Um, and so, and so the and so the. Um, Failure of the banks, you know. So people are pulling their money out of pulling their money out of banks. Banks have less money to lend, so you have sort of a further tightening of uh, credit and unwillingness to lend because of the bank run, which you know leads consumers to feel like they have to pull back, uh, pull back on consumption. Businesses are pulling back on investment, uh, and eventually, after after a year or so of this, there's a there's a feeling that. Um, you know that there's a, a big loss of confidence by banks and consumers. They no longer feel like this is a limited crisis. Um, this is a temp sort of temporary shock that they're weathering, uh, and this is sort of the you know uh, FDR's uh, you know I you know idea from his fire one of his fireside chats that you have, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, this is sort of the the time when fear itself sort of raises its ugly head, um, and. Uh, so that, and so there, this is sort of, um, 
kind of part of the, so this is sort of one, um, one of the reasons that economic historians sort of see as a, um, a cause of why the, the Great Depression was so severe and lasted as long as it did. Um, there are a number of other reasons. I mean, people think about poor, you know, poor management of monetary policy by the Fed in response to all these banking crises and to the, um, and to the, the slowing of the, uh, the economy initially in 1928. Um, people talk a lot about the, um, you know, the unwinding of the, the gold standard as, as you know, countries are trying to defend their fixed exchange rates. Uh, other people in other countries pulling their money out of uh, pulling money out of uh, their international obligations and sort of making bank runs uh, bank runs worse. Uh, people also really think that some people are also argue that really the you know the most important thing was the um, you know the overinvestment that happened in the uh, in the twenties. Um, and so the second lesson you know is that. I think of the Great Depression is that 70 years have passed and, and economists are still debating what happened and what, what caused it. Um, what, what was the relative importance of these different elements? Well, there are people still argue about them. And I think that the lesson that comes out of, uh, that, comes out of that is that, you know, it's, it's unlikely that this crisis is going to be the same as any other past crisis. And, you know, we need to sort of have some uh, some humility in trying to understand it, and also sort of not lose our curiosity about uh, about what's going on, and you know think that we've sort of found the fix, and then things are going to uh, are going to get better. I think that there's a um, you know a need to understand the details as they're as they're coming out, and to keep sort of pushing on uh, to to keep sort of pushing on that. Um, and so the, yeah, so the, that's basically my my view of that. Thanks. Um, why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? It can be on anything at all. Um, Kyle, if I could ask you to come up. I'm going to send this microphone out there. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll just circulate the microphone. You don't have to stand up here if you don't want to. All right, sure. Stand up at the table, maybe. Go ahead. Um, all right, I'll walk speak into the microphone. Okay. Uh, I, uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, so far for the information. It's been great. Uh, enjoyed listening to everybody so far. I wanted to go back to the beginning of uh, Justin's talk. Uh, we talked right at the beginning uh, about a concept I think most economists agree to as of right now, the root problem of, uh, of the crisis is a lack of capital, uh, which is I guess the incentive or the, uh, the reason why we would choose the equity infusion method of addressing this problem. Um, I don't think, or it, I personally uh, don't feel that there's been uh, enough discussion about what that actually means uh, or what that uh, was caused by. What is a lack of capital? Um, I guess in particular, I wanted to tie that back to the idea that um, this lack of capital needs to come from some sort of uh, behavior, some sort of policy. Uh, in particular, how uh, we, we're seeing a lot of problems with mortgage-backed securities. We're seeing a lot of problems with uh, too much credit in consumer hands, in co uh, company hands, in bank hands. So um, if you could talk a little bit, anybody, about, um, for example, what uh, impact mortgage rates, artificially low mortgage rates, and also an artificially low uh, interest rate set by the Fed would have on, I guess, capital across the board, but in particular in the hands of uh, large banks and the central bank. So let me just see if I can re rephrase. You had two questions. One is, um, can you talk a little bit more about capital, why these banks need capital? What's that, so what, what's that all about? Um, and secondly, uh, can you, some of you talk about loose credit and what's causing it and how much of an issue that is? Well, and actually, I guess in particular it would be, does that loose credit uh, on any level tie into the concept of a lack of capital? Okay. Anybody want to handle the capital issue? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to go back very many years. I think it's somewhere between three and four when there were a lot of commentators saying, the world is awash in capital and always will be. We've got to get used to it. Now, so, so the question of what happened between then and now is, is the relevant one. I think you, you really have to bring in some, some concepts from Austrian economics now, and that is that there has been a lot of malinvestment. The, the, the evidence is out there in the foreclosed and, and empty houses. Uh, a lot of capital got tied up in a form that that 
is obviously not appropriate. And how did that happen? It happened because interest rates were suppressed and through other devices the society was 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 diverting a lot of capital into this this really unproductive use. Not that housing is unproductive, but excess housing is unproductive. And and so we've got to face the fact that that uh, a, a third of the capital tied up in the housing stock was wasted, and the sooner we realize it and confront the fact, uh, the better off we'll be, because obviously the housing prices of two years ago are not consistent with the incomes of today or of two years ago. And the only things that can change are either to change the values that we impute to that housing stock, in the words of uh, Andrew Mellon, a Secretary of Treasury in the 1920s, liquidate, 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 or to uh, inflate income so that they do match the, uh, the dollar value of the housing stock. And uh, neither one of those is particularly attractive. Would anybody else add anything to the, to the capital side? What about interest rates? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the other side of it. That's uh, exactly what I was going to talk about in connection with the classical theory of banking. So, okay, uh, let, let me just, just say that um, it falls to old timers to, to give some historical perspective. That doesn't mean that I was around before the Fed, but it, do, it does mean that the Fed, which is about to celebrate its 100th birthday in five years was, was only 45 years old when I bought the fir my first copy of Purposes and Functions of the Federal Reserve System. All right, there were panics, and recover uh, panics before the Fed was established, and there were also recoveries. These are not new. They, they certainly predate the Federal Reserve. Prior to the existence of the Federal Reserve, there tended to be short booms, financial booms, with, with you know, the same symptoms, uh, great exuberance, but then very, very sharp corrections. These were frequent. They were pronounced in the financial sector, but they did not have a big spillover into the, into the real parts of the economy. Um, <clears throat> what the Fed has done has been to, to give a longer leash to unsustainable trends. So that, uh, for example, you had the 1920s episode leading to the Great Depression. Uh, you had the great inflation of the 1970s. And the, the current meltdown simply would not have been, the, the events leading to the meltdown would not have been possible if at the moment when we observed gold prices starting to rise, that had actually been a drain of gold out of the system and the banking system had been linked in some meaningful way to gold. That would have brought it up short and ended it, ended the problem several years ago. There would have been a panic, there would have been some sort of meltdown, but it would not have been, it would not have involved misallocating all of this real investment over the intervening years. Well, the monetary orthodoxy uh, that, that developed uh, in the in the late 19th century was you know there was primarily a British model, but um, but was well known in the United States too. And the banking system in that orthodox model was supposed to concentrate on the commercial banking system. You could have a bank holding company or something equivalent with other divisions, but commercial banking was supposed to concentrate on what were known as CIA loans, and that was not uh, off-budget financing of clandest clandestine activities. These were commercial, industrial, and agricultural loans. The real bills theory took this a little further, and it said the banking system would be self-regulating if, if the banks issued only these CIA bills. That's perhaps stretching it, but that meant that, that these were, these were pieces of paper that arose in ordinary commercial transactions. The goods were on the way to market. The bank could finance it, and that was working capital. Um, you also needed a gold standard to keep the system from getting out of control. The, the dissent, and if you, if you look at, at money and banking textbooks from the 1940s into the 1970s, and maybe, might, maybe more recently, that explained to you that the real bills doctrine is no good because, all right, 
the bank between the, the, the merchants who are creating these commercial pieces of paper, you can have some sort of complicity and, and, and higher values put on it. If the bank endorses it, then you've got inflation. Uh, it's highly susceptible to excessive exuberance, you know, and, and also there's a technical question of whether the same goods might have commercial paper written on them on the way from the wholesaler to the retailer and, and from the benefactor to the wholesaler, and so you get double counting. Those points are all well taken, and so the, the, the situation, the, the real bills doctrine could, should not be taken as something that's totally self-regulating. But the question is, what do you have to replace it now? You know, with lending, lending on, on assets, existing assets that are not new goods coming to market, you get the creation of money for something that's just a transfer among people anyway. The asset's already there. You haven't created anything new, and you certainly have the same valuation problems which we've seen in spades in, in, the recent, in recent years. Um, and real estate lending is the easiest to become totally unhinged because of the completely inelastic supply of land the long lead times to transform agricultural land into, into uh, residential land, uh, no imports to, to offset the effects, um, and the fact that low interest rates are very quickly capitalized into very high prices by the mechanism, how big a mortgage can you afford? And so, so you know, that we were sort of heading down the road to disaster. Well, what are the what are the remedies within the classical model? Um, you, you know, I've mentioned liquidation, and, and uh, I can, you know, that, that was uh, pretty well known right from the beginning. Uh, uh, let's go back to, uh, uh, go back to 1907, which was a major financial panic, and very interesting because it was the one that inspired the work that led to the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. And if you look at what Professor A. P. F. Andrew of Harvard said about that, QJE 1907, if business crises resulted from overtrading and overspeculative propensities of the community, a stringent market will spontaneously afford the best sort of remedy by forcing a reduction in bank liabilities or liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. Um, there are some other possibilities, though. Uh, you know, if you, if you look at the old descriptions of the Federal Reserve System, they talk about a rediscount rate, where we talk about a discount rate. And the reason is that the Fed was, in the, was set up to be in the business not of discounting treasury paper, but of rediscounting these, these, this commercial paper that the bankers had already discounted. If the banker needed cash, he would go to the Fed and rediscount his, his commercial, industrial, and agricultural loans. I think the, probably the closest parallel today, since institutions, financing institutions have changed, the, probably the closest parallel to the old CIA loans is commercial paper, and this would suggest that if you want a classical mem uh, a classical remedy, you would go toward the Fed uh, serving as a rediscounter of commercial paper in some in some way. But the other approach, uh, which which uh, one of my friends Mason Gaffney has suggested, is that we could simply inject more capital into the into the uh, loan markets very directly by, by starting to pay down some of the federal debt. That's not a very pro uh, popular solution today. If, uh, there's also a good deal of literature about the role of the, of the uh, Secretary of Treasury. Uh, in the period from the Civil War until the Fed, the, the, the Secretary of Treasury became, in effect, a central banker. And engaged in open market operations. It was a little bit complicated by the fact that the Treasury consistently ran a budget surplus during this period, and that makes some open market operations difficult. There was a strong seasonal component at that time because of the agricultural nature of the economy, and this didn't correlate very well with the seasonal inflows of funds and outflows of expenditures to the Treasury. But the, the um, 
uh, in particular, the, the, the Secretary of Treasury in 1906, uh, Secretary Shaw, was, was quite explicit about the open market operations he was conducting. And the complaint that was raised in progressive quarters, I should say, is what is to, in, what is to hinder some benevolent autocrat of the Treasury hereafter from buying stocks in support of the stock market? And his response in the, uh, in the, uh, treasure, the, the report of the Secretary of Treasury of 1906 was to say, if the Secretary of Treasury were given $100 million, 100 million, not billions of trillions, to be deposited with the banks or withdrawn as he might deem expedient, and if in addition he were clothed with authority over the reserves of the several banks, with power to contract the national bank circulation at pleasure, in my judgment, no panic, as distinguished from industrial stagnation, could threaten either the US or Europe that he could not avert. So hubris is not confined to uh, modern secretaries of treasury. Um, George uh, Cortelia, who a, uh, a non-activist, succeeded Shaw in March 1907, just prior to the panic of 1907, and he did not use those great powers that Shaw had asked for, or even the powers that Shaw actually had. But it is worth noting that the, uh, the panic itself was over by 1908. I mean, this was an enormous panic with, with the uh, um, uh, major collapses of the stock market in, in March and, and in November. Uh, the, the failure of the uh, Knickerbocker Bank that failed in, uh, in October, uh, bond prices bottomed in, in, uh, in November, but the depression itself was over by the end of 1908. Uh, would that we were so, so good at doing it. Um, and, and finally, I, I want to say that, the, that, that I was interested when I picked up this, this copy of the uh, Chase Economic Bulletin for February 11th, 1929. It's a piece by Benjamin Anderson, uh, who was a fine economist. He was the economist of the Chase National Bank in New York. He wrote about two new eras compared, 1896 to 1903 and 1921 to 1928. And I want to read just a couple of little passages here. One, which he has the conclusion um, first, uh, he said, uh, you know, history repeats itself after a fashion, but with many differences. Okay, it's sufficient for the present to conclude that our own new era, just before the big stock market crash at 29, our own new era is not, after all, so very new in principle that like causes produce like results, that excessive gold and excessive bank reserves generate bank expansion, that bank expansion running in excess of commercial needs will overflow into capital uses and speculative employments, and that low interest rates and abundant credit will ordinarily reflect themselves in rapidly rising capital values. One further generalization may be ventured, namely that eras of speculation are fond of developing theories which will justify their speculative activities and that the theory that a new era has come in which old economic laws are suspended is as useful as any other for this purpose. But not to leave you on such a, um, on such a uh, uh, dispiriting note, but let's go to his section on what follows new eras. New eras spend their force and things become humdrum again. We do not go back to the situation that existed before the new era came. We do not, in a growing country like the United States, cease to make the normal increase in volume of production and business activity, but we do cease to break financial records for a while, and we have our problems of liquidation and readjustment when we correct our misconceptions, revise our plans, and consolidate our position. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I guess I'm a little bit confused as to um, the role of economists in, in, in moving forward. And it seems like economists look back to predict the future, but I haven't heard many economists anywhere, except maybe for Rubini at a CERN, talking about what could happen moving forward. Can I just hear something about what are the current threats right now? Maybe it's something about the, the bond market, the commodities market, something about the price of the dollar relative to the yen and the, the euro and, and, and the fears associated with deflation, and then on the other side, inflation after that. Just something moving forward now that all this, the nightmare scenarios have, have at least for the time subsided. Well, so, you know, I think to some extent one answer to that is all of the above that you mentioned, people, people mentioned. So if people were good at forecasting the next problem, we wouldn't have the next problem, um, or at least if there was a broad consensus on what the next problem was. And so, you know, there are a few things that keep cropping up. So there has been some discussion of, you know, commercial debts that are going to come due, the credit card defaults that are likely to mount over the next, you know, year or two have been big. Um, those are some, you know, straightforward ones. I think others might have better sense of kind of the international's perspective. I'm definitely not an expert on, you know, currency movements and things like that, but there's certainly some undercurrent of that that people have started talking about. I don't know. Um, I'm going to... Um, take a slightly different approach uh, to what we have been discussing so far. Uh, so one uh, thing that I noticed is, uh, I think, I you mentioned at the beginning of uh, your question uh, that capitalization is the crux of the problem. Is that correct? So Scott, can you just uh, go back on your slides on the elements of talk? Yeah. So out of these elements here, um, which one do you think is most important? Oh, you said this was going to be a class. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm following your lead. You say show of hands, right? Let's, so show of hands on, uh, say, a one. Do you think that's the most important element of, ta of top? Or... Uh, Scott, what do you think? What do you think I think is the most element? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've spoken too much already. So. <laughs> okay, so let me give you a new, uh, or not new, some different academic perspective of, uh, of the TARP and uh, of generally what is the problem that, that we are facing. Okay, so I think the most important component there is executive compensation restrictions. Okay? So here is, uh, let me explain why. So uh, it's not just executive compensation of the financial institutions or AIG or the junkets that AIG indulge in that I am concerned with. I am concerned with something even greater. That's not the executive compensation package of, uh, of the firm that is crucially important. That is important by itself but it is the executive <laughs> compensation package of the certifiers or the financial intermediaries that are crucially important. Okay? So the crux of the problem, just stepping back and looking at it academically, is asymmetric information. So there are buyers uh, and sellers, and the sellers or the originators know more about their products than the buyers or the investors. Okay? So how can we mitigate this asymmetric information? So there are usually two ways uh, that you can think of doing that. One is through regulation, and the other is the critical role that financial intermediaries or certifiers play. Okay. So think of the simple case of a firm making an IP or an SEO, seasoned equity offering. There is asymmetric information, right? As Justin said, there is the problem of lemons between the issuer and the investor. So there are regulations to address disclosure, but equally important, or perhaps more important, is who is the investment bank that brings the issue to the market? Okay, so if it is Goldman Sachs, then investors tend to believe more uh, about the future of that issue than other banks. And the reason is these top intermediary firms have reputational capital at stake. Okay? 
so, but ha have they performed? Have the certifiers performed? Let's look at investment banks, and the answer is mixed. So you, 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 if you recall, Elliot Spitzer, in its pr previous incarnation, was the New York Attorney General, right? So he was prosecuting some of these cases involving investment banks. For instance, there was this famous uh, Friends of Frank uh, syndrome, uh, Frank Quatron of uh, CSFB, who was selling uh, uh, or alleged to be selling uh, or issuing a hot IPOs in those bubble years to future clients, CEOs of future, future clients. Or there was pressure on the analyst to misreport information on future clients and so on. Okay? So clearly the certifier role has not worked with investment banks. Has it worked with auditors? And again, the answer is mixed because you know the Arthur Anderson case, which led to the SAR box. Okay? Uh, has it worked in this case? And here, who is the certifier? It is the rating agencies. It is the SNPs and the Moody's who have certified that this class of assets is rated AAA, okay? So is it rated AAA? And you, you must have read about the recent congressional hearings on that. So the uh, representative Henry Waxman said that this is a colossal failure of the rating agencies to properly perform their functions. So what is the underlying thread across all this? It could be the case that the executives of these certifiers, the rating agencies, the insurers, the investment banks, the accounting firms are paid by the employers. They get their pay from their employers and not from the investors whom they are protecting. Okay? So we le that leads us to this important topic that maybe we need to think hard about changing the executive compensation plan of not just the firms that are originators, but of the certifiers as well. Okay? So that is where I think <laughs> a lot of brain power and thought needs to go into play because this is the crux of the problem and we need to fix it for the long term, not just fix it temporarily with capitalization or buying preferred shares in banks in the short run. Okay, so maybe there could be uh, stock option plans on phantom stocks where uh, the employees or the executives have to wait for five years before they can ex uh, exercise that. So it is some sort of compensation held hostage to their future performance. So we have to think in those terms. So that is my academic spin to the, th the thing. So rather than just commenting on this crisis now, I'm just thinking more and seeing what is the crux of the big problem. You know, uh, I have some interest data here as well uh, that uh, of those investment banks and some of them that failed. Like Merrill Lynch uh, allocated this year $6.7 billion for bonus. And, uh, and that was down 20 Ex Merrill Lynch, ex Merrill Lynch, even if the stock price went down seven percent, the average bonus per employee for this year is going to go up compared to last year. Now, I explain a little bit because they fired some people, uh, but uh, and the trend is out there. Uh, Lehman Brothers that went bankrupt. Some some employees are getting their bonus for this, you know. But they should uh, this this just getting away from the financial. Uh, Companies. One of the, let's say, consequence or unintended, maybe intended consequence of all this financial mess has to do with property bubble. Right? In the sense that, if you think about another interest piece of data, 2007, the average CEO uh, salary for the S&P 500 was about 14 million dollars. 2006 was 10 billion dollars, and that's uh, let me tell you, that's. 365 times the average U.S. worker salary. You, know, you don't want to need, you don't need to go too much down the past. In 1980, the average CEO would earn 42 times the salary of average U.S. worker. So this thing has fired down a lot. The question: Who cares, right? If you have a less fair or free market approach, well, those are private enterprises. They pay whatever they want, right? And if you're not happy with the guy supposedly the guys perform. That's why they're getting he's getting or he or she's getting good salary. And if he's not he or she is not performing, just fire him. Okay? But it's not that simple. How do you fire or how do you hire a CEO? That has to do to property governance. The sets of policies, procedures, people that determine how management and control takes place in a company. And that seems a little bit controversial at least how things work. 
how things work. So I have to manage like the CEO, the CFO, and then, but you don't hire, you shareholder, the owner, you don't hire the CEO. Actually what you do is that you vote for the board. The board of directors is the institution that has the duties to control the management. The problem is, uh, even nowadays, you are a shareholder, you're the owner of the company, you can't, what you can't do is that you can vote for some direction. Now I'm gonna give you just a simple example of some rule of corporate governance and what I think is gonna uh, 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 br uh, be brought back to the spotlight. So you can, you can vote for the direction, but you cannot nominate, right? Well, I'm, even if I'm a big shareholder, 5% stake, which in the US is huge, you cannot say, hey, why in the next meeting when I have to vote, I wanted to put my name there? Or I want you to vote to the name of someone that I think is better qualified. You cannot do that. Who nominates is the current board and the current CEO, right? Well, they tried to change that. Uh, the last cry was 2003, and the rule was quite simple. If you have more than 5%, so you can put your name on the rules. But uh, the, the, the campaign stalled, right? And the most, uh, the current try was actually 2007. And, and, and interesting thing is that, who, who defined this thing in the SEC? So the SEC put down two proposals. One, there was just a qualification of an old proposal saying that, hey, uh, if someone uh, established a policy to nominate directors, this thing can be just taken away by the current board. Right. And the other proposal was that, yes, you can, if you have more than 5%, if you, and if you're a passive investor in the sense that you're not current manager, so you can put, establish, uh, uh, you can write down a policy that would be included in the bylaws regarding nomination by shareholders. But what happened, this was the last year, the proposal stalled again. So what I think is that the, uh, this laissez-faire attitude that the companies of private enterprise works if we don't have the government as the land of last resort. We don't have, but if we have the government, well, if things go down, if things go bad, uh, then the government's gonna come and it's gonna help you, right? Wins, like if it goes up a win, if it goes down, it's on lose. Right, so I think this thing is gonna come back, not exactly related to the, to the bailouts or the, the, the religious financial uh, uh, complication of the financial mess, but I think this thing is gonna come back full force uh, uh, recently uh, in the future. Of course, this is related to politics. There's two proposals that I talked about. Uh, uh, SEC have uh, five, let's say, uh, directors. Uh, one of them is the chairman. Uh, one of the proposals was that would a lot of the company, that was just a clarification, all the company to take that thing out of the board was, uh, 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 came from the two Republicans on the board. The proposal that would allow uh, the, 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 big, the big passive shareholder to include the policy came from the two Democrats on the board. Uh, the, the chairman actually voted or wrote down the two proposals. None of them passed it, but uh, this thing can come back. But I can see how this thing is, is related to politics as well. Thank you. And I'm gonna encourage, um, what I'm gonna encourage all this week, we've all added um, some interesting perspectives. I'm gonna ask for questions for the audience and if I can have our panelists try to give us succinct answers that are on point to the question asked, I think this will go really well for a little bit more. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Mindy? Can, uh, can you, you just grab the microphone? Thanks. There is a, a about the, the diff, there's another piece of interest data. Uh, they are forecasted that half of the bailout money would go towards the dividend payment. Not because there are dividend increase, actually dividend can, can only increase if the government allows. But just the continuation of the dividend payments would eat up half of that money in three years. Is that an option? Well, if you go to Germany or Britain, the way they wrote their policies, 
the companies, as long as they have money from the government, they cannot pay dividends. They have to have the dividends. So there is an option of that. But I guess uh, uh, we are still more inclined towards the free market assets. Now, there are some implications as well because dividends are important, et cetera, it's kind of information for the market. But there is an alternative. So I just have a follow-up question to that. Um, clearly, PNC used their bailout money to purchase National City Bank. Um, so essentially, it was free, as Scott pointed out. Um, are the European governments allowing uh, the banks that they bail out to do the same thing, to use uh, this infusion of capital to purchase other banks? No, they have, they, have to make, they have to make loans. This is one weakness of the program in the United States. The banks have not been required to make loans. They are basically being begged by the treasurer to do so. But in Europe, in UK, we basically had the first program that we basically imitated here. The banks are required to make loans. Now let me, let me clarify something in the PNC deal as well. You know, technically, PNC is acquiring National City by issuing shares. I mean, if we look back a year or two ago, their shares were probably on par or close, and now it's a very small fractional share of PNC that's being uh, exchanged for National City, but essentially it is a stock for stock take under, okay? The $7.7 .7 billion that, that, that has come in is really the, the way they're determining um, how much is given to each of these banks is based on a, a formula that is based on the assets of the bank. So it's based on the combined assets of Nat City and PNC. So I don't think it's fair to say that the $7.7 .7 billion is more than PNC is paying. I mean, the numbers add up that way, but it is a share for share exchange. The bigger bank includes the, um, the bad assets of National City, and so the 7.7 .7 is, a, is a blanket of, of tier one capital to support that combined operation. I'm not advocating that it was the right thing to do, that was the concept. So it's not really they paid for the acquisition because they're issuing more shares. And getting back to this question a little bit about, you know, are these guys crazy in this culture? I mean, I, th I think part of the thing is that the, you know, there hasn't been that big of a cultural shift so far on what's appropriate in terms of these payouts. So, you know, one of the reasons that the bailout, the equity infusions are phrased as they are, so there are these purchases of this preferred stock, was that they didn't want to dilute the shares of the existing shareholders, so they didn't want to hurt the value of existing shareholders. So there still hasn't been sort of a widespread consensus that this is a pain that the shareholders should bear. Um, and so, you know, I think there is an extent to which they're operating to make the most money they can in an environment where no one has said, look, you, this is your fault and you're taking responsibility for it. At least that's my take on that. That's no longer consensus of brilliant economists. That's words of <laughs> Other questions? One thing is bankruptcies, one thing is acquisition. First of all, in general, I think it was mentioned before, there is a sense that there is nothing wrong, actually, it may be a positive thing that solvent, well-run bank buy out banks that uh, you know are in trouble uh, and make them work better, there is some consolidation. I, I haven't heard much about that being a bad thing, actually. It's, it's just the market operating if it is, uh, if it is just that. So in general, it can be a positive thing. Then, of course, at the local level, there are worries about uh, job losses and things like that. These are all, of course, issues to be taken into greater account and market power, uh, definitely. Although even there, there is a consensus about the economy, so whether some form of concentration, a little bit of market power by banks at the local level may be a good or bad thing because it might facilitate the you know, the creation of relationship with, with long-term relation with local firms, which can be beneficial overall to facilitate investments and job creation and so on. So the debate is definitely open on that regard. Other questions? Yeah.
think ultimately your question is uh, what, where's the bottom of the housing market and what pricing support can we get from housing at the, at the bottom? And, uh, you know, that's a difficult question to answer. that should put a floor on the mortgage is outstanding. And that will, that's kind of where the problem started, everything else will start even, <coughs> more with that way. Yeah. Not immediately, In terms of how far we have to go to the bottom, this is one thing I saw in my review of Brilliant Economists. So they, most of the estimates suggest that we have something like 15% to 30% more to go in terms of the fall in the housing price index to get back to sort of normal levels historical norms. Um, so that's the sort of numbers that people like Rubini that was mentioned before are putting out there. Um, who knows if that's right? I, that's a hard thing to guess, but that's the kind of numbers you're seeing. That's right. Yeah, I want to follow up. In fact, I want to pose a question to Bill. Uh, could you put out that list of uh, our I didn't know the slide. Are we doing so far? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill. Yeah, yeah. This one? Bill. Liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. Would you be in favor of basically adding a new provision here to have the treasury basically go out and buy houses that have been either abandoned or are falling in price so that uh, the government would simply start destroying them? We can't export them, they're not tradable. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, this has happened tongue in cheek, but I mean, no, I, I basically would, following the logic of what you said. I, I would not support the treasury is doing this. Oh, but, whoever, the government, but, whatever. But, uh, Local, local governments have, have done it in some places. Uh, other, otherwise, it's, it's only the value that has to, has to be liquidated. And that's yeah, but I mean, if you, if you have an overhang of these houses, that's what's keeping the prices down, right? If you have an excess supply, as you pointed right, out. Right, right. So yeah. wouldn't the house prices go up if the supply is restricted? One, one, Isn't that what we one, teach our students? One, one could restrict <laughs> the supply enough, but, but the, the house prices have to, have to come into some sort of consistency with income. Yeah, but and you said either the incomes have to rise yeah. or the house prices have to basically right. rise, right? The, the, the house prices go down. Go the, no, go, go down in the sense that... Yeah, yeah. No, but the, <coughs> the point, well, the question was asked, that what's driving the crisis it, is the housing problem. Sure, sure. The, 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 the depressed prices of the houses, which but are basically... Not, but they're not depressed enough yet. Is, is okay, so what I'm suggesting is, why don't we just go out and dis start destroying houses? So, so the fundamental problem with that approach <laughs> would be... Uh, so, I mean, the fundamental problem is the idea there is that you buy cheap houses, you destroy them, and that raises the value of all the remaining housing. Right? Yeah. The problem with that is that as soon as people know that you're flooding the market to buy the cheap houses, you have to buy expensive houses because the market yeah, price rises yeah. immediately. So they know you're going to destroy them. That puts a new value to houses. <laughs> and so the government can prop up, can create this new housing price, but they're going to have to pay for you, them you, at you, the going, you, at the you, final market. You have to get back to fundamentals. We, we, you know, you're, gonna, you're going to lose a third of the capital stock in value because the houses are overpriced. But I don't think you gain by, uh, by uh, eliminating the other two thirds by tearing it down. No, I said one third. You said excess supply one third. Right. Yeah. And it, you know, the, the uh, as far as, as far as the, there being too many houses, um, sure, the, there there is an inventory, and that means that that you don't need to put new resources into building new houses for for another year or two. Um, I think there must be more productive uses for construction labor. And some of it is already done back in Mexico. So I mean, is this any different from uh, the Keynesian solution of digging ditches no, to create a no, farmer? No, I mean, it's no. the same unproductive use of yeah, resources yeah. to destroy and, and in you, order to bring you, the market up. And you and you have to you have to step back and say, what do you want with the capital stock? Do you want less of it or do you want more of it? Tim? Well, so I was unsure. Don't we already have? I mean, it's, it's part of this PowerPoint. It's not on here. There is some of that the buy from the biggest homes that are abandoned or. In real economy, and just to follow up on some of the connections that David was making between the real economy and the, the financial economy, 
we now actually think, you know, we shouldn't, and I'm going to get back to succinctly and briefly to uh, Austin's challenge in a second, but to me, you know, there's a lot of benefits to low interest rates. I mean, I think the problem uh, in, its, in the sense that it makes stuff cheap, we can get things that are useful and investments that wouldn't pay off otherwise then pay off. I think that's, you know, can be a good thing. The problem is when it happens in an environment where there isn't regulation, where the incentives are, are messed up, as you guys are saying. Um, and so it seems like, um, I mean, I think it's a great challenge that Austin has thrown out, thrown out to us that, you know, yeah, sure, we could solve one problem, but it's kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I guess I think uh, there's a proposal, I guess maybe it's the same article by um, uh, Zingales that uh, was being referred to, this idea of, um, you, you, you do a need to reduce the values of these prices, and, and part of the reason it hasn't happened is before all the securitization happened, there was an incentive. You had two people or two parties. You had the homeowner and you had the banker, and they both would lose in a foreclosure. Now the ownership of the security is so split up that there's all these transaction costs and legal barriers to establishing a deal. So then if you can make a deal where people agree to accept less, then you get this liquidation of value without having a financial value without having to destroy it. And so this is kind of interesting proposal. Uh, Congress should pass a law that makes recontracting available to all homeowners living in a zip code whose house price has dropped by more than 20% since the time they bought the property. Um, and so then what you do is you give the mortgage holder the choice um, Oh, I'm sorry, the mortgage holder has to accept it, uh, this deal, if they're in a, you know, loaning in one of these uh, zip codes. The um, homeowner has the choice, though, about what they want the deal. Um, they, can e they can take a deal that says they're going to reduce the size of their mortgage now, but they have to share with the mortgage holder any upside. And so that means that people who you know are solvent and think there's going to be an upside are not going to rush to take advantage of this program. It's it's actually picking off those people who really are in trouble, uh, perhaps through no fault of their own. I think some of Robin Dubin's research in Cleveland suggests that there's plenty of people who are disadvantaged when there's a foreclosed house in your neighborhood. You have done nothing, nothing wrong, but your house is worth less. So I think there's there's ways that we can do this liquidation without destroying physical capital. Why don't we take one more question? We're you know we're essentially on the five o'clock hour. Anybody want to take us out with one more question? All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us. I want to thank my colleagues and thank you all for attending. And uh, hope you got something out of it. Thank you. <laughs>